I was recently asked why I put so much time and effort into speaking about New Zealand's national security. The same reason you should, I replied. For our children, nieces, nephews and their children. Hi, I'm Simon Ewing Jarvie. It's our responsibility to live a better, safer, freer country than we inherited. And the only way that's going to happen is if ordinary citizens are involved in the national security conversation. That conversation should start with a comprehensive national security strategy being formulated, not the compartmentalised and under-resourced thinking which has been allowed to take hold, because that is indefensible, New Zealand. Welcome, I'm Heather Roy, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the first in a new podcast series by Simon Ewing Jarvi called Indefensible New Zealand. Simon has a number of unique experiences and insights into the area of national security from 25 years in uniform in New Zealand through to working in national security academia and policy development and Simon you are now a very active national security commentator. I really enjoy reading your UNCLAS blog where you've traversed a a hugely wide range of defence and national security issues And now you're launching this podcast series, Indefensible New Zealand. That's right, Heather. Thanks for the introduction. Yes, uh, there's been lots of writings and lots of uh, presentations over the years from me on this subject. Uh, Now it's time for the podcast series. And I'm really looking forward to being able to explore the internal workings of national security as it applies to New Zealand, particularly uh, in this form where we're not constrained with sound bites and, and word counts. Yeah. It's nice not to be in that situation. So Indefensible New Zealand, what does that mean? How did you come up with the name? Well, um, I surveyed friends and um, ended up choosing a topic that none of them had suggested. But don't worry, friends, <laughs> we're going to use your titles for the episodes. It, indefensible, something is indefensible, means you can't defend it. So Indefensible New Zealand, New Zealand takes us to that sort of imagery and also in the terms of the old saying of you know explaining is losing in, in politics of course if you are trying to um, defend the indefensible then you've already lost and uh, so you could take that perspective on it as well. Hmm. So your podcast series is about the issue of national security. I think sometimes this means different things to, in, in, to different people so can you tell us what you mean by national security? Yes, if you think about our lifestyle here in New Zealand we, we take it for granted, I guess, that we're safe and we're free and, and, and secure here. But take away any of the elements that, that build that, whether it be warm houses, the ability to move, get health care, and including stopping um, people invading our shores, any one of those elements, if it becomes zero, results in a product of zero for national security. So it's very important that we look at national security in the broadest possible sense as a multiplier effect of all the different elements of our life. So it's defence, it's yep. biosecurity, yep. Customs, customs, corrections, police, it's our health system. All these elements, if one of them were taken away, we would have a situation where we wouldn't be so safe, we wouldn't be so free, and we certainly wouldn't be uh, secure. Mm. So I suspect if you asked most Kiwis about national security, they'd automatically think about defence, that's sort of the natural order of things. And I think most of them would probably assume that the government's pretty much got things covered. You're clearly saying that's not the case. What is New Zealand currently doing in the national security space? Well, the system of national security in New Zealand is a committee-based system with a handbook written by the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. It basically invokes a a committee of officials from different ministries and departments uh, and a, a similar group of Cabinet Ministers to react to an event. And that committee will form up, they'll choose an agency to lead it, Uh, and they'll decide how they're going to react to that event. Now, obviously, it's reactive. Mm. We've actually done pretty well over the the decades with dealing with natural disasters, particularly, you know, earthquakes and the like. So there's nothing wrong with taking that approach if you're just dealing with a singular event at a time. But it's a hopeless system if you're thinking about a fast-moving, dynamic threat situation. Yeah. And and have we got the, you said we've done a relatively good job, but has that been good luck rather than good management? There's been a huge amount of good luck um, involved in it, Heather, and I don't think that's actually good enough. What we need to be looking at is a a, a far more comprehensive national security strategy. And look, planning doesn't cost you anything. We're not talking about billions of dollars here. We're talking about removing silos out of Parliament uh, and getting people together to talk about a comprehensive view of national security. And the only way that 
really that can happen is to put aside the, the short-term electoral thinking that politicians and officials are locked into, the th these three-year cycles. Instead, look out to future New Zealand and what the world that we're going to hand on to our children is going to be like and how do we make that more secure for them? One criticism that I constantly hear is that we've got a set of guidelines but nothing that approaches a plan or a real strategy. Do you do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. No business would run on the basis that this um, national security plan operates on. And what we do need to do is separate the national security planning and execution processes from the political cycle. And there's a couple of easy things that we can do. Firstly, we can develop a strategy. Yep. Secondly, we can appoint a national security advisor and you make them an officer of parliament just like the ombudsman and the speaker and the auditor general so they can't be messed with by individual changes of government or ministers and they're only answerable to the, the, the whole parliament. And then you have a, a national security agency where all the, all the information sources and all the capability sources all come together. So, for instance, look in, in, in intelligence, you've got multiple intelligence streams across GCSB, SIS, customs, police and so on and so forth. We need to have a, a nexus where all of this information and all of the other aspects that I'm going to talk about, about national security, come together, are processed and put into a coherent approach to national security for New Zealand. You talked, um, when we when I first asked you about the, the origins of the podcast series, about having the conversation. Are we having the conversation at the moment? Well, there's lots of conversations going on, but I think a lot of it's um, just process for process's sake. The problem with conversations generally is that most people won't put their actual positions on the table, and so you've got to poke and prod and basically light a few fires, set a few platforms alight to actually get anyone to react and show their true colours. We've got to have a better conversation than that, and that's going to be a theme that I'm going to run through the podcast, is that actually what we need to do to have a better conversation, an ongoing one, about national security improvements in New Zealand. Hmm. So I'm really keen to hear more about what you're going to cover in your Indefensible New Zealand podcast series. Okay, well, there's um, it's wide-ranging, but basically you could say it's about what do we need to do to keep Kiwis safe now and in the future. And uh, so... We have to start, well, what, is, what does a likely future look like for national security? And we're not talking three, five, ten year cycles. We're talking 30 to 50 years we need to be thinking about. Now, I know people will say you can't possibly imagine what the world would be, will be like there. And that's true but irrelevant because we know it'll be different to now. So if we keep doing the same things as we're doing now, we'll keep preparing for now. Uh, we do know it'll be more digitised, it'll be more interconnected. We may or may not have experienced or be experiencing uh, regional conflict and hopefully not, but possibly world conflict. Um, we know that um, all sorts of things that we take for granted now will have changed in 30 to 50 years, and so we have to look at those assumptions and say, will are they resilient for the future? What's the future look like? How big is the gap between where our national security profile is now and what it needs to be to deal with that future? Mm -hmm. What do we do, need to do right now, and what sort of timeline do we need to be operating on. We need to focus on, I'm going to unashamedly hat tip to uh, Jim Molan, Senator Jim Molan's Australian podcast, Noise Before Defeat, where he talks about self-reliance versus self-sufficiency. It would be madness economically to be, try and become self-sufficient, do everything ourselves all the time. When we can buy in the, in the world market at good prices, we should. But the point is a self-reliant country is one that when we can't do that, we can still produce what we need to be secure and safe inside our own country, ourselves. And at the moment, we are not self-reliant and we lack manufacturing capability, we make, lack emergency reserves and we're going to go through a whole lot of those elements within the arms and services of state to see what needs to change and, and how soon. Yeah, that sounds great. So I'm hoping that you're not the only person thinking along these lines in New Zealand. Are there others that you're going to involve in your podcast series? Uh, absolutely. There'll be a rolling mall of politicians and officials and academics and industry leaders and some ordinary citizens some of my mates even <laughs> get, get them <laughs> well, in and see what they think because actually at the end of the day politicians won't make these changes that, that, that need to occur until enough people, enough voters convince them that if they don't they're not going to be politicians for very much longer. And that's the point of having the conversation isn't it? Is it? Absolutely yeah. the point. And so when we look back on history 
there's all sorts of times and places where lack of preparedness has uh, shown itself for what it is, lack of preparedness. Mm. Are there any in particular that sort of spring to mind when you, when you think about national security in our situation now? Well, two world wars for a start, we just got downright lucky. Yep. We weren't prepared for either war, we went, went off happily singing, and luckily we had some fairly powerful friends and a quite a good intelligence system that was able to crack some codes. Mm. It's delusional to think that we're actually very good at war. And Jim makes this point on his podcast as well. We are tough, but so are other people, and we, we've been lucky. And no one should presume that we'll just continue to be lucky. No, you can't bank on that. No, and as Benjamin Franklin said, by failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. That's a very sobering statement, isn't it? That's it for this episode of Indefensible New Zealand. Thanks for joining the National Security Conversation. If you found this podcast episode useful, please subscribe and share it with your friends. For more information on New Zealand's national security or to send in questions for the series, please go to my website, unclass.com. Mm-hmm.